I think this could probably be my most anticipated video to date so far. This is my review of the 14-inch M1 Max MacBook Pro. Now I've had this computer for about two months now, and in the process to clicking buy, I watched a lot of reviews, as I'm sure you have as well. And I don't want this review just to be another one of those. You know that it's a great computer. You've heard amazing things about it. You've heard that the fan never comes on. By the way, the fan does come on. But my question after seeing all of those reviews was number one, how is it possible for all of these reviews to be so gushing about a computer? That never happens. And two, is it possible not only for this to be a great computer, but the only computer you have in your setup? I guess the third question I had was, but is this actually any good for music producers? Because I think the goalposts are being pushed further and further apart, not for our use case, but for the likes of graphic designers, video editors, and stuff like that. With the exception of these 4K videos that I'm making, I don't really have a need for that. So my two priorities were graphic performance for the YouTube stuff and portability because of all the work I do with Spitfire. So I wanna break this video down into my use case the spec that I went for, what I think about the design, and then my general experience of using this computer every day over the last two months. So as I say, I've had this thing for about two months now, and in that time, I've really been caning it. I'm working on a feature film at the moment, which is very exciting. So I'm composing with lots of big sample libraries and audio plugins. I'm continuing to do my work for Spitfire Audio. So writing demos, creating videos, writing trailers and teasers, and also beta testing the libraries, which as of right now are all M1 native, there are a couple of betas for older libraries that they're still ironing out little bugs, but for the most part, every new library that comes out is M1 native, and they're doing really good things actually to make this as easy a transition as possible. And I continue to be a music producer for Gary Barlow, which entails many, many projects across the board, across lots of different media formats, and involves lots of high intensity sample libraries and audio plugins and things like that. I guess, as a side note to all of that, I also have this YouTube channel. And part of the reason I bought this computer was because I needed great graphical performance, being able to edit multiple streams of 4K video and running a 4K monitor to be able to record the screen flow that comes from this monitor at the same time as recording audio into Pro Tools while showing something in Logic. So I needed a little bit more headroom than you might expect if you're just running sessions in Logic. Now, I would say for anyone who's using lots of big sample libraries, I would say 32 gigabytes of RAM is probably the minimum that you'd want to go. 16 feels a little bit too limiting to me. Um, 32 is, is about right, I would say, but if you can get any more, I would. I think that kind of future proofs you a little bit. And the work I do with Spitfire does require me to travel over to the Spitfire HQ near King's Cross. So naturally I wanted to have a computer that I could throw in my bag. And that has been something that's been really good so far on this machine. So what did I end up getting? Well, I got the 14 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro and I basically topped it out almost. I got the 24 core GPU with a 10 core CPU, 64 gigabytes of unified memory, two terabytes SSD, and that came to the grand price of £3,799 or $3,899. Now, I'm gonna put that figure to the side for a second because I know a lot of people are gonna say, you can't possibly be recommending that someone buys this if they're just starting out. That's obviously not what I'm suggesting. And I would say, I would hope that you have control over your own finances, that you know if you need a computer that goes that little bit further. There is this thing of the law of diminishing returns, how the more you spend, gradually, it doesn't necessarily get a huge amount better. You have to spend quite a lot more to get just that little extra five or 10% performance increase. And for the most part, most people aren't gonna need that top performance, especially if you do this for a living. And I would like to remind you that I'm not a hobbyist, this is my career. I am a full-time composer, producer, and musician. So for me, this is absolutely an investment. This is something that I will make money back off. Um, and so for me, it's far more of a no-brainer than it might be for you if you're just dabbling in music for the first time. Now, I'm a real fan of the design of this computer. I'm sure you've seen lots of beautiful B-roll, so I'm gonna go over the design fairly quickly, but it is a really beautiful computer. It kind of reminds me of the old PowerBooks, and it also reminds me of my 2015 MacBook Pro. It's the return of the ports, which I'm very excited about, including a new high-impedance headphone jack. And just as a bit of a disclaimer, 
I use the Bear Dynamic DT990 Pro headphones. These are the 250 ohm version. So normally I would need an amplifier of some sort if I were using this just with a laptop on its own. However, I'm able to plug this directly into the headphone output. And I would say for the most part, if I'm listening to music or I'm mastering, so at a, a kind of nominal game volume, I would say I can listen to this comfortably at about 40%, whereas I'd have had to absolutely crank it on my old computer. So that bodes really, really well. And I would say if I'm taking this out and about now and I'm just doing a little bit of writing on a train or I'm just taking something with me, I can take my headphones, but I don't actually need to take an interface now, which is very, very good news. They've removed the touch bar in favor of physical buttons. They brought back MagSafe and the new 120 Hertz display is beautiful. It feels snappy and responsive and is incredibly bright, even in light conditions. It's not a must for music creators, I'll be honest, but when you switch from 120 Hertz to 60 hertz, you really do notice that difference, particularly in the response of the cursor. And of course, this display comes with a notch, which I am not convinced about. I understand that you need some space for the camera and for the various other sensors and things like that, but they could have easily fitted Face ID to this. But also, I don't think the notch needs to be that size. I have a feeling it's there to homogenize it against the iPhone lineup and to make it look a little bit different. People will know that you've got the new MacBook Pro because you've got the one with the notch. That being said, I don't notice it at all. It's not something that you think, oh God, it's just right there all the time. And when you're running applications in full screen, that bar at the top becomes completely black anyway. So for the most part, all you're really losing is nothing. What you're gaining is that toolbar at the top. The fact that the mouse kind of just moves behind it is a little bit strange. And the fact that when it first came out, there were lots of people complaining that menu bar items were being hidden behind the notch. When you take a screenshot, it doesn't have a notch in the cutout there. So it's just a bit bizarre, but, um, but there you go. That's what it is. Key travel on this machine is significantly improved. And again, it's kind of reminiscent of the older MacBooks. I particularly like the black design and the keys have a thuddy sound, which I think is less likely to attract attention on trains and in cafes. And I think the trackpad is really good as well. It's sort of the perfect size on the 14 inch. The 16 inch version is definitely too big for me. This feels very comfortable, even though I'm not a trackpad guy. Uh, this is going to be absolutely fine for me. Now, our good old friend macOS Monterey has removed silent clicking as a feature from the trackpad, which I'm very disappointed about because it was really, really cool. For those of you who don't know, trackpads don't actually have a physical touch anymore. It is haptic feedback. It's a motor that kicks up from underneath. So the sound you hear is completely artificial. And for a long time on my old MacBook Pro, I was able to enable silent clicking to get this beautifully, slightly softer, muted sound, which is a little bit more pleasing to the ear than the current clicking option. Now, while I'm here, I want to talk about Apple's right to repair, which they recently went back on. Um, I'm going to leave a link down below and at the end of this video to a really fantastic video that goes into a lot more detail than I can right now, talking about Apple's war against right to repair. For us to be able to buy equipment and parts from Apple directly to repair rather than taking stuff into the Apple store and them charging us an inordinate amount of money. With this new MacBook Pro, it seems that it's been designed in a way that will make it easier to replace parts. So I'm quite excited that if I do at some point want to replace the battery on my computer, it should be a little bit easier with this model than it has been in the past. Now, the way this integrates into my setup here, I'm using a 4K LG monitor. I've got an Apollo twin interface. I've got a big complete control S88 here. I'm using a standard Apple Magic Keyboard with a Logitech MX Master 3. And to connect my hard drives and my various peripherals, I'm using a Blackmagic Multi-Dock and also this Anchor 5-in-1 Ethernet hub, which connects to my old USB-A hub. So that's been really helpful, actually, and everything seems to work fine from that. I've also got a hard drive, which is an old backup of my Mac Mini, so I can always access my old files if I need them. Now, this being the M1 Max MacBook Pro, I got the 96-watt charger that connects via MagSafe, and it's been really good so far. I would say it can charge up to about 50% in 30 minutes. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic so far. I have noticed, though, that my Apollo Twin does deliver 15 watts of power to my MacBook Pro. And this means that I can have the laptop closed in clamshell mode because it thinks it's receiving some power. Now, 15 watts is never enough to fully charge this thing, but it's enough that it slows down the... Um, gradual kind of decline in the battery throughout the day. So I would say that if I arrive at the studio with 100% charge, by the end of the day, 
I'm going to be on about 10%, but that is eight hours of pretty intense music making plugged into a 4K monitor. So that's not 10 hours of battery life, but that's 10 hours with a 15 watt power attached to it. I know that's a bit of an obscure statistic, but anyway, there you go. Now, when I'm going portable, I have a little Akai keyboard, and uh, this is connected to the same Anker 5-in-1 Ethernet hub. I've got my little VS Vader box here, which is still going strong. And as I say, I've got the DT990 headphones that can plug straight into that high impedance headphone output, which is great. Now, a lot of people on Instagram and Twitter ask me why I bothered to buy the 14-inch rather than the 16-inch. So I just want to go over some of the trade-offs. Obviously, the 14-inch is significantly lighter, with this machine weighing about 1.6 kilograms, plus the weight of the charger in my bag, versus 2.1 kilograms plus charger. Now, a lot of people wouldn't care that this amount of weight is sitting in their backpack every day. But for me, I'm far less likely to take my laptop everywhere if it's heavy. And with this, it's a bit of a no-brainer. I take it everywhere, even if I know that I'm not going to need a laptop. And I would rather, in the same way that people say the best camera you have is the one you have with you, I would say, if I can have the very best computer that fits in a rucksack and is under two kilograms, that's a real saving to me. The 14 inch is also just that little bit more portable. You know, it fits on your lap really easily. You can put it on the table next to other things and it doesn't cramp up the space too much. And obviously it fits in your bag a lot more easily. I would say the 14 inch versus 16 inch question is not just about two inches more screen space. There's actually quite a lot of trade-offs with the 14 against the 16, which I'm going to list to you now. For one thing, obviously, bigger screen on the 16-inch, and the notch is the same size on the 16-inch as it is on the 14, so it appears to be smaller on the 16-inch. With this bigger design, you also get bigger battery life, bigger fans, bigger speakers, and a bigger trackpad. Although, as I've said, I prefer the 14-inch trackpad. And you also have high power mode, which enables your computer to go into overdrive to do those really highly intensive tasks. That being said, I actually keep my computer on low battery mode all the time because the performance is absolutely stellar, even on the 14-inch model. It's the same processor. And I would say for music making, I don't hear the fans at all. Um, you can hear it a little bit if you kind of put your ear right up to it. The only time I hear the fans come on is right towards the end of video editing, if it's rendering something or if I'm exporting video. But other than that, I don't hear the fans at all. And that in and of itself is a really amazing achievement for Apple. Now I'm using this computer all the time and I do travel quite a lot. So the 14 inch is kind of ideal for me, but the difference in price for the equivalent spec from the 14 to the 16 inch is 200 pounds. Now that might be a deal breaker to you. I would say if I were using this in a more regular place of work all the time, I would say the 16 inch is probably worth the money. Now I had lots of questions on Instagram and Twitter asking me how many instances of Omnisphere can you run? How many instances of contact? And I started this experiment kind of as a joke thinking, okay, well, we'll reach a hundred instances with all of the Legato transitions. We'll have every articulation loaded. I've got about 35 gigabytes of RAM loaded in. This is gonna be fun. Let me just put a reverb on every channel. And sure enough, it just wouldn't break. So I got bored of that experiment quite quickly and decided in the end just to tell you that it works. That if you really want to put it through its paces, this can do what a lot of old desktop computers couldn't do. And in fact, my friend Ryan has the 16 inch M1 Max and he says that it runs faster than his 2020 Mac Pro, which is saying a lot considering how expensive those machines are. Now I can run big orchestral projects on this computer at a buffer speed of 256. That is really quite insane. That's with plugins, that's with reverbs, that's with mastering, 256. That's pretty good. And that's going through a 4K screen at the same time. So, you know, I, I was opening up some of my old projects that I was running on my Intel Mac Mini. And I remember at the time having to unplug from my 4K monitor and plug into a 1080p monitor and still have to max out the buffer speed to 1024 in order to get everything to play properly. With this, I can run it through the external monitor without the fans on at 256. It's bonkers. It really is insane. That, that's... Yeah, better than I ever thought it would be. Now, in terms of the plug-in compatibility with M1, I've kind of decided to run things in Rosetta for the foreseeable future. Um, the reason for this is because the CPU load seems to be about the same when I run it in Rosetta versus with M1 native. Some plugins are not M1 native yet, and I would say 99% of my plugins, in fact, basically every plugin except Analog Lab from Arturia, does work in Logic 
absolutely no problems at all. I haven't had any issues. So in terms of my use case within Logic and Final Cut Pro, um, I would say that they've worked absolutely perfectly, but you would kind of expect that because they're so well optimized for the M1 machines. And as far as things like contact, lots of people had concerns that contact was not gonna work. Contact works brilliantly. Every library I've used with contact works seamlessly. Um, probably the most stable plugin that I've used so far with this new M1 Max. One thing that I have been asked as well is whether or not the 14 inch screen is big enough day to day. And as I say, for the most part, I'm sitting here at my desk with a 4K monitor. When I go over to Spitfire, there's another monitor there that I can plug into. So I don't tend to have to use this display for much, except maybe a little bit of editing or maybe a little bit of note taking, things like that for planning these videos. So I would say for the most part, it's kind of the perfect size. Like this is what it looks like on Logic and Final Cut. You can see that, yes, there might not be quite as much real estate as you might get on the 16 inch, but you can always optimize that by scaling down a little bit and adding a bit more space. I really don't have any issues with the screen space at all. I think it might annoy me if I were using this as my only screen, um, but because I have a 27 inch screen here, I don't have any issues with using this when I'm at home at all. Now I mentioned this thing earlier about the law of diminishing returns, how the more money you spend, basically the smaller the performance increase each time, the difference between a 100 and 200 pound machine is gonna be massive in comparison to a 3,900 and 4,000 pound machine. So I would say for the most part, is this computer well specced for us music producers? I would say it's over specced, but I think we know to expect that because we want it to last. We want to future-proof ourselves a little bit. And I would like to get at least five years out of this computer. I know I said that about my Intel Mac mini, but my entire life has changed since I got that computer. So uh, I had no idea what the requirements were gonna be of that system at the time. All I can tell you right now is that it's a bloody brilliant machine. It really is very, very good. And if you can stomach the price tag and you need that extra performance, I think it's a bit of a no brainer. This is the best MacBook Pro for years. Um, so what would be the perfect spec? Because I know that I'm not everyone and some people are gonna have smaller or higher requirements than, than I would. If I would recommend a machine for anyone to go out and buy that is kind of middle of the road, I would probably suggest getting the 16 inch model because I think a lot of people will enjoy the bigger speakers, the bigger screen, the better battery life. And I would recommend the M1 Pro with 32 gigabytes of RAM, unless you need that extra performance with graphical performance. Uh, for me, I do, so I, I'm glad that I got the M1 Max, but if you're just running it through a 4K display, I think the M1 Pro should be absolutely fine. And I think two terabytes of internal storage is probably a good amount. Um, I actually edit all of my 4K videos remotely on this machine, and the SSDs are crazy fast, so I would say, as a bonus, if you can have as much stuff stored locally as possible, I would really recommend it. Just a quick note on video editing. I recently made a video with Gary Barlow, which is probably my biggest edit today. It's about half an hour long. Uh, if it's available, I'll leave it linked down below. I, it's not currently up at the moment, so I won't spoil it. Um, but basically it has so many streams of 4K video and kind of overlapping content with the screen flow and then a bit of the camera footage and things like that. So my, by far my most involved edit, half an hour long video, and it exported in low power mode uh, in about six minutes. So that is pretty incredible because that's not something that I've ever seen before. In comparison, by the way, my Intel Mac mini would have taken about 50 minutes, maybe an hour to do the same task. And by the way, I could continue to use my computer doing other things on this one, whereas the Mac mini would have just died. Um, so yeah, very, very impressed on the video editing front. I know that's not something that is interesting to everyone. So that's why I've kind of put this at the end. Um, but yeah, if you make YouTube videos, this machine is absolutely fantastic. I think that's basically everything I've got to say about it. If you haven't already, do please subscribe. There's lots of very exciting stuff coming up soon. The production's getting bigger this year. There are four or five videos already in the works that are more than just me. And I'm really excited to take you on that journey and to show you some of the stuff that I've got planned. So do stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you again very, very soon. Goodbye.